Hey, friends, welcome to The Right Side Up with Danielle Strickland and James Scholl, usually. Um, this season is an eclectic mix of fascinating topics with incredible people that I've had the privilege to meet and to talk through most of them, to read their books, to be amazed by some of the things that are happening. I'm calling this the wild card season. Wild card, because you never know from episode to episode what you're going to get and what we're going to talk about, but it's going to be fun. I promise you that. You know, I spent a whole lifetime being told to either slow down or to stick to one thing. But I have always been an eclectic, wild, curious, um, wide ranged person. And I love it. I love it. And I think God likes it too. And I hope you enjoy these eclectic conversations with amazing people um, about some really important topics. It's a wide range. It's a wild card. Get ready to enjoy. Welcome. All right. The Right Side Up is welcoming and thrilled to have Shane Claiborne in the house. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you. Yeah, just wonderful. Shane, I'm really glad are... to be here with both of y'all as well. Just very exciting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As I was saying before this, I'm, I'm like a stand-in audience surrogate for all of y'all listening, but like, wow, what a great conversation to be part of. So I'm excited <laughs> too. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, uh, James. You know, um, this season, it's a hodgepodge of all these different voices. And I, I, I'm calling it the wild card season because you just Sweet. really don't know from week to week what conversation you're going to have. And I thought, you know, what, who, who represents wild card more than Shane Claiborne? You know? <laughs> Nobody. So I'm like, Shane, please. But also I am very, very interested in um, the Gaza situation, as you know, as part of that peace pilgrimage uh, in mm -hmm. Vancouver here, which is carrying on. Can you, you've recently been to Bethlehem and mm. uh, hosted a conference um, there and have been part of a team that's been, you know, doing this global movement, working towards peace. Can you just give us an update, get us up to speed, tell us what you're doing, and then I have many more questions. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I am still, my, my heart and my head are spinning from just getting back from the West Bank. I was in Bethlehem, which, uh, no, not everybody knows. I'm learning that, 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 you know, where that little town where Jesus was born is on the other side of the wall. So that's in the, in, in the, uh, um, the territory over there. Um, that, uh, that's where we were gathered at Bethlehem Bible college. This conference has been going on for a bunch of years and uh, like seven, I think Danielle. And, um, uh, this year they weren't sure, you know, can we pull this off with the security concerns and things like that? So they were hoping for maybe 50 international folks and like over 200 showed up. So it was mm -hmm. so um, encouraging for our Palestinian friends over there to know that like uh, there's so many folks that are um, listening and learning and standing in solidarity with them. So I, it was great to be there. Um, even with the heaviness of everything happening, maybe especially with the heaviness of everything happening, you know? And uh, so, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that we've been uh, really clear about from the beginning is that uh, what happened on October 7th is, is horrific. Uh, 1200 precious lives that were, were lost. And now the, the, you know, folks that are still being held hostage. We've always been grieving that, asking for the hostages to be released, uh, denouncing anti-Semitism and all violence, right? And yet what we see in the past, you know, 200 days or so since um, October 7th is, um, it is just absolutely heart-wrenching that, you know, it's we don't even know the numbers now, but uh, nearly 40,000 lives that have been lost, half of those children. Um, and many of our friends in Bethlehem, their family members, I mean, you know, uh, Shireen and Yusef, they put, you know, the, the, the pictures of all of their loved ones and, you know, kids they grew up with and family members that have died. And um, um, so that's, that, that, that's, it's been, you know, really heavy, I think on many of our hearts, but to say that, that, that um, two wrongs don't make a right, you know, or, or as Jesus, I think, teaches so powerfully, like um, that 
we live by the sword, we, we die by the sword. And that's what we kind of keep. We keep living and dying by the sword, Danielle. <laughs> we, and it's, it's, it's so many lives are being lost. So the way of Jesus in the world today. And, and for me, like when I go to, to listen to these Palestinian theologians and pastors, it is so refreshing because they are centered around Jesus. Everything mm-hmm. they say and write is anchored in Jesus. One of them, you love this, Danielle. She, um, Tony said, the measure of a heresy is how far your theology is from Jesus. <laughs> you know, that Amen. distance between Amen. My, my theology and Jesus. And so it's centered around Jesus and also because of that, centered around nonviolence. So there's a real deep history of practice and pursuit of nonviolence. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, that's what we've been saying, like in the violence, in the ceasefire, like let the hostages go, let in the humanitarian aid. Let's reimagine uh, what 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 real freedom and justice look like, what equality for Palestinians and Israeli lives if we valued them both as equally mm-hmm. precious and made in the image of God. It's also why South, the South African folks have been really helpful, Danielle. There's a whole delegation from South Africa that came, um, Sean, who's the ambassador uh, from South Africa to Palestine. Incredible mm-hmm. brother, uh, rooted in his faith and also the history of uh, the the battle against apartheid, of the you know segregation in South Africa. But it's also about reimagining the country, right? So that's where South Africa is such a beautiful um, uh, presence because they they've re they've reimagined their country and re, you know crafted a new constitution. So there's a lot of things that they offer on the political and kind of social side of things as well as all the spiritual and theology and stuff that we were working with too. So yeah, man, I love I love that the reimagining. Like um, so, I I've, I've uh, met and worked in Bethlehem with Sammy Awad um, yeah. a fair bit, who is a, a Palestinian peace activist there. Uh, what is, is the Awads are a big part of the Bethlehem Bible college and, uh, Palestinian family. And I remember, I remember years ago, like just, I, I remember realizing just how boring, um, violence is, Mm. you know, I remember Mm. you actually, you did either an, I think you did an endorsement for my book on the walking dead. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. Like, I don't know what's going on with zombies (laughs) and Danielle, but. I just like trust Danielle. Like that was basically what you're endorsing. Like, I do not get what she's doing. But the full last chapter of that book was just like literally the story of The Walking Dead gets incredibly boring because all it is is the same story repeated. And because that's violent, it's so boring. It just does the same thing over and over. There's nothing creative about it. There's nothing imaginative mm. about it. There's nothing that's going to end the the story differently. And that's what I feel like. It's like we're witnessing this, like, you know, just repeat history, repeat it, repeat it, because we lack an imagination for anything different. Mm, So mm. one of the things I think that you offer the world, not just in this, because I also want to ask you about peacemaking in general um, and this blessing that you seem to have uh, been given as a follower of Jesus to be a peacemaker and Mm. how much of that peacemaking is related to this reawakening of an imagination that the world could be different. Mm, uh, mm. We don't, and I, I, you know, the inevitability that's in the air, like, you know, when you bring this up, people are just like, well, it's going to happen. Mm. You know, it's just going to happen. Like this is going to, it has to happen. I'm just like, it does not have to happen. It does not have to happen. And there's just this lack of dreaming potential and imagination. Um, how do we do when you're in such a crisis, you know, like, so you're in Gaza, like, I love what you're doing also with the guns and the beating them into plowshares. You know, I want to talk to you about that in a bit, because all you're doing is provoking people's imagination. Um, And when you're doing it, when you're creating this alternative, you know, possibility, it like exposes the principalities that are mm. against it. Mm. Right. So like when you're in Gaza, talk me through, or when you're in the West bank, and you're hosting this, like, talk me through one, what is happening in terms of the imagination of possibility? So is it, I mean, it must, it must be so despairing to be there and at the same time, hopeful, talk me through that. And then talk me through that exposing of like, when we provoke imagination, what is this thing that's coming against us? Mm. 
Yeah, well, I think when it comes to what it feels like being there, it, 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 it they um, in many different ways, our Palestinian friends there have said it's it's the best of times and the worst of times. You know, in, in the one hand, it's kind of like when Jesus said the wheat and the weeds are all growing together. And I said, it, it kind of feels like someone just spilled fertilizer all over it. So, you know, the bad stuff and the good stuff is all uh, growing on steroids. But uh, but when we were there, it, it um, I think what we heard over and over is this deep grief of the the massive violence and the silence of many people that we would hope would be prophetic voices and, you know, of, of conscience, uh, even you know, leaders in the United States and, and uh, uh, places that are continuing to sort of sidestep or defend and even arm uh, Israel. At the same time, we're going, we're really upset about what Israel did. So upset, we're going to give them more bombs. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. And um, so I think there's that disappointment, that that deep fatigue. Um, but there's this this incredible energy that we felt like the whole world has risen up to stand with uh, Palestinians and to recognize their humanity and call for their freedom. Uh, so that's amazing. You know, I, I think we haven't ever seen that in our lifetime. And so for many of them, it's, it's sort of this um, dual thing, but, but for, for the, the Christians there who, who I was with, you know, there's another layer of this, which is that some of the worst theology has been exposed in this. Um, mm. I don't know how much we want to talk about that, Daniel. But, but, but I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's. I want to hear it. <laughs> there's all kinds of little, um, like variations of it, right? So I mean, there's the whacked out stuff that's just like all of this is bringing Jesus back. You know, like we need mm -hmm. tens of it's thousands of people to of die. Armageddon. Yeah, right, right, right. John Hagee, the battle of Gog and Magog and whatnot, you know, I mean, like just whacked out. Who's also um, crazy anti-Semitic. That's what's fascinating to me is that this, you know, a lot of that kind of bad theology from Revelation is so incredibly anti-Semitic, but also pro-Israel. It's this bizarre. And I think people are seeing how bizarre that is. Yeah. And I mean, so the idea is that, you know, Israel had to be formed as a real state and nation and 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 so i mean listen to this james like well, i was just hearing someone try to articulate this theology that they had heard you know preached and they were two different versions of J folks that are gathering jews into the state of israel there were the gatherers and the hunters and so they were even defending hitler as one who hunted jewish people and killed them and it concentrated them in israel as an end product of that. So you end up with the most whacked out theology, right? When you get into this kind of um, end time stuff, but there's more subtle or more subtle forms of it, right? So like, I don't know most folks that are in the John Hagee camp of that. This is just, you know, Armageddon happening. But I think that there is what Mitri Raheb, one of the great Palestinian theologians has said, is that there's a Holocaust hermeneutic that has emerged that that and this is how he describes it is that there is this centuries old anti-Semitism that climaxed in the Holocaust. But Christians know our own complicity in that. And I kind of outline this in my newest book, Rethinking Life. Like I call it one of the original sins of Christianity was anti-Semitism and saying it was the Jews that killed Jesus and Hitler like like was the champion of that, right? He said, just as Jesus cleared the temple of the Jews, I'm cleansing the world of them. And so like this poisonous, terrible theology. Um, but because Christians have been complicit in that, we end up um, not being able to be any voice of conscience to Israel as a state now, because we think that's anti-Semitic, right? Like that's what yeah. people label it as. So like, there, there's a moral immunity. Israel, the state of Israel can do no wrong. And if you speak out against the policies of the nation state of Israel, somehow it's anti-Semitic. And I think that's the, that's what Mitri kind of means by the Holocaust hermeneutic. So we've created a way of justifying things that are 
indefensible that we wouldn't allow anyone else to do except that it's Israel because of what the, the past, you know, the past uh, that that the, the, the violence that they've endured and had targeted to them. And that, that's where we get, just got to do better. Right. And and um, and so there's so much that's correcting that really skewed and messed up theology and hermeneutic. And uh, uh, so that's why I love being with our, our folks over there in Palestine. Bad theology like kills, guys. It, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like it, it also makes it I also think this is theologically terrible, but also they've they've done this politically and you see the state of Israel's genius in one way of equating any critique of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so, I mean, it's just it's horrifying on so many levels. Like it's it's because you've done that then it makes it really difficult to speak out against the state of Israel when everybody's saying every time you do that, you're an anti-Semitic. Yeah. But then it also on the flip side is horrible because I think some of the rise of anti-Semitism in the world today is because of that. So because yes. you, right? So I'm like, this is bad for everybody. Like this is bad for like holding a nation to account morally. This is terrible for that because it lacks critique and it lacks open critique. And then this is horrible for Jews. Like it's bad yes. for Jews because some of my best, you know, beautiful Jesus followers I know, and then also like just people who are Jewish that I love, um, this is bad for them because every time the state of Israel does something horrible, it's on them. Yeah. And and I, they they want, yeah. And many of them don't want that either, you know, so, you know, like the apartheid situation where everybody's like, this is only people in the West are thinking this, but everybody in Israel is supportive of it. Um, somebody recently said, and I, I agreed with this, when this lifts, finally, it will be clear that there were many, many, many Jews against this. There's so Israel. many Israelis who speak so, so right. strongly against Netanyahu, against their government. This is what's right. so strange again if you're saying criticism of Netanyahu is anti-semitic when his harshest critics are in israel criticizing him i mean it's yeah mind-blowing yeah and, and i think it's it's been pointed out by many practicing jewish people that Netanyahu is not really very practicing faithful jewish person he's definitely using the religion in ways we've mm -hmm. seen it done in our country <laughs> you know to kind of yes. exploit the worst of it to weaponize it um, to use it as a facade to, to kind of camouflage your own um, hatred and violence. Um, so, I mean, and then Yahoo's also, you know, he's from Philadelphia. He's like, that's where, you know, he's got some roots. And so it, it, I think there's something about the powerful witness of Jewish mm -hmm. folks all over the country and all over the world right now. I mean, there's mm -hmm. rabbis for ceasefire. There's, uh, if not now, Jews, you know, for ceasefire. There's all kinds of different groups that um, thousands and thousands of people. And this is what's interesting. It's not like using their faith as a facade. It's actually fueled by their own faith. And there's a, you know, obviously deep anti-imperial uh, 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 theological grounding for Jewish folks. So it's been incredible to collaborate on that. Uh, and yeah. um, courage has a lot of different forms too. So I don't know if you saw Danielle, but we just had a, a forum with these young conscientious objectors. So these are young people, 19, yeah. 20 years old, that are being asked and in a sense drafted into two-year mandatory service in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, and they've refused. They've said, my conscience will not allow me to serve, uh, and they've gone to jail for it. So uh, there's there's more and more of those. We hope that there will be more and more of those those courageous young people that many of them are deeply committed to their Jewish faith, and that because of that, they will not serve in Israeli defense forces. So we, we've got to kind of keep stirring that sort of um, thing. But it, that's such a huge cost. I mean, they, they are abused. They are put in jail, you know. Uh, yeah. So courage has a lot of different forms and is very costly these days. Um, yeah, we met But with when, the, you, when you weigh that against the, what's going, going on in Gaza, like yeah. we've got to raise the, the bar of what we expect of ourselves. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I was I was saying uh, breaking the silence is a group of ex soldiers that have told the truth about their own service and what they saw sort of like breaking through that uh, veneer of, you know, this is a righteous, um, violent thing. Yeah. And and unprovoked, you know, this is about like and I remember I was on a trip there with Amplify Peace where we go to 
the West Bank and we go to Bethlehem and we contemplate some of these things and we go to uh, Shabbat at a Jewish person's house to just try to like mm -hmm. um, move and, and learn. And I remember, I remember this, this uh, breaking the silence uh, ex-soldier coming on our bus and then just telling us a story on the bus and then like the bus driver dropping them off so they could get out of there before they were picked up. Like they're mm. like they are the enemy of the state in many ways because they're the great truth tellers of the state. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So well, you know, and, and courage, courage is contagious. So it's really exciting to see that, to see the student encampments and also to see the organizers of those um, trying to be very disciplined in their messaging and their nonviolence. There is anti-Semitism that can arise from those settings. So to say, no, we stand on the side of love and this is not about mm -hmm. being anti-Jewish. It's about being, you know, pro every, every person's life and dignity. So that's been really, really great. And courage looks real different, right, Danielle? Like we, every one of us, whether we're Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, or whether we're Danielle or James or Shane, we've got to ask like, what, what does courage look like? for us right now because there's so much at stake yeah and it's hard to measure yet it's hard to know you just know that there is a cost you know so everyone should know that you peacemaking comes with a blessing and it also comes mm. with a cost but i would suggest that in the ways of jesus the blessing always outweighs the cost mm. and the costs are almost always connected to the value system of a dominant culture anyway mm. so um like I led the, I helped lead the peace pilgrimage here in Vancouver. And um, I think four or five different organizations sort of reached out to say where we've gone in a different direction for a guest at our conference. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and you're just like, okay, great. Cause actually I maybe don't want to go to that conference anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the, but the, 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 and it's not an outright, like they're not like decrying me or like, you know, but definitely there's a cost involved. It's like, why are they surprised, Danielle? This is what I don't get. It's like, oh, this person who has been on the side of justice for her entire life has spoken up for an oppressed people. Like, yeah, it's this it's, every it's, time it's yeah, people just seem to, oh, not Danielle, of all the people to stand up for victims. <laughs> Well, I think it's partly what Shane was saying earlier. I think it really partly is this um, the toxic theology and this this theology that mirrors and connects itself to a dominant culture, um, which yeah, is really yeah. just empire theology, right? It yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, I, I was doing a youth event and, and it was actually called Do Justice. And I was asked, uh, I was kind of interrogated on what I would say about uh, Gaza at the event. And I'm like, you know, it probably, it was not the center of my message, but to say we, we can't talk, we're going to do an event on justice, but not talk about Gaza is a very I would probably do that. justice. That's what yeah. I do. Like, <laughs> But, you know, I, I think, um, I, you know, as I think about, um, you know, where, where we're at right now, it's why it's so important to avoid just the binaries. Like this is a soccer game or something, you know? And so I think we, we can, that's why our messaging has always been um, that what happened on October 7th is wrong. Anti-Semitism is wrong. The hostages need to be released. That's mm -hmm. one. Two is that two wrongs don't make a right. What's happened since October 7th is state revenge and it's evil and wrong and no one can defend what's happening in Gaza. So cease fire, stop it now, let the humanitarian aid be let in and stop arming them, right? Like, like stop giving them the weapons. Uh, I'm, one of the things that struck me as I was over there is seeing these um, casings from the bombs and the tear gas, and they say made in the USA on them. That's why we did, you know, our direct action and our vigil mm -hmm. At Lockheed Martin, which is one of the biggest profiteers of war. So, you, you, you know, that old saying goes, if you want to stop violence, figure out who's profiting from it. And certainly Lockheed Martin is one of, you know, the, the big profiteers from war that the bombs, the weapons are made there that are being used in Gaza. So that, that's part of why I feel a responsibility, too. I mean, it's a little different Canada, although you, you haven't helped a whole lot up there with your policies and war profiteers as well. But, uh, you know, for us, it's like this is it is not accurate to call this Israel's war on Gaza. Is it, it is the United States and Israel's war on Gaza with the silence and complicity of many other players. But um, well, you just I mean, had could not happen Nikki, without us. 
I can't remember your drama, but Nick, is it Nikki Haley that just yeah signed signing the missiles them? finished them? And then you know, and she's one of those many politicians I think that that claims to be Christian and to go to church on Sunday. And so there comes a point where this is not just about you know a political debate, but this is a really a spiritual crisis for for mm -hmm. anyone in the church when when our faith is being twisted to justify mm -hmm. things that are so unchristlike um that that's what you know really becomes at stake and that's why i think we share such a kindred spirit and you know of like wanting people to know the love of jesus and seeing one of the big obstacles to that is this hypocritical and um christianity or what's camouflaging itself as christianity but it re really doesn't have anything to do with jesus and yeah. and um, uh, so that's that's and and for Palestinian folks too, with their deep roots, it's why they're so helpful in helping us name that, right? That there there are all kinds of ways that we have created um, theology that uh, doesn't uh, make us more loving, and it it actually can create a real monster out of God if we're not careful. Oh wow, and how that you know how that partly how that's helpful is that the original jesus and early christ followers and the scriptures were written by oppressed people groups so when you read the scriptures from that lens you know from that place it makes it makes the scriptures come alive in a way that is you know jesus focused and jesus centered when you read the scriptures from places of power and empire and control and dominance, they sound different. And then they, they lead to different things. So part of the gift, I think, is the depth, the witness from, from that place of like, how do we wrestle with the person of Jesus and the witness of Jesus and even nonviolence from a place of oppressedness? Like, how do we do that? But then also, I think people, you know, people get surprised. I remember you, uh, when you went to Iraq, I remember this, like way back when the, that war was happening, I remember tweeting somebody like somebody, I tweeted, you know, ceasefire now or something. And somebody said, this is uh, Israel's 9-11. And I wrote back saying, exactly. Don't make the same yeah. mistake. America, like who on earth? Like I disagreed then too, you guys, like this is not. And I remember you went, you flew there and sort of, you were like, surprise guys. I met like, you know, Christians that were, you know, from generations of thousands of years, um, you know, and everyone going like, they're not Christian. They're not Christian. And I think sometimes in the Palestinian too, we're just like, they're not Christian. Like it's like this, you know, yeah. Muslims against Jews situation. And you're like, no guys, the oldest church, like this is the birthplace of Jesus. These are Christian Palestinian Christians who've been Christians since the very, very beginning. Yeah. Uh, this is the oldest church in the world. You bombed, you know, that yeah. just got bombed and somehow Christians aren't feeling the empathy with their brothers and sisters, literal brothers and sisters, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, one of my most powerful memories being in Iraq was when we were in a prayer service praying for peace in Baghdad. Uh, there were at the time 900 bombs a day were being dropped on Iraq, mainly in Baghdad. And so we were living through that. Um, and it was just the first few days of that we had this prayer meeting and it was so powerful to me. I mean, uh, you know, I, kind of tell the whole story and you've probably heard me tell it many times, but you know, was, we sang amazing grace in Arabic. Um, and then I went to the altar and I was really got my charismatic, you know, hallelujah. And I, I went up to one of the bishops and I said, I had no idea that there were so many Christians in Baghdad. And he goes, yeah, this is where it started. You know, that's the Tigris River and the Euphrates. And then he said, you know, he goes, the Garden of Eden's right down the street. <laughs> and and then he said, you didn't invent Christianity in North America. You just domesticated it. And I want you to go back and tell the church in North America that we are praying for them. We're praying for them to remember who they are and to yeah. actually follow Jesus, you know, yeah. Um and, and what does it mean to follow Jesus right now in this moment? So uh, you're exactly right. That's what happened to me over and over from being there, being in Afghanistan, being in, uh, uh, you know, Palestine is is you have new eyes to, to understand both scripture, but also the situations that we see on the news that kind of shape our constructs and imagination on this. And uh, I've always liked that old saying where you sit determines what you see. And it's certainly true. Um, and, and I mean, it is, I hear that all the time, the October 7th, 9-11 parallel. And you're like, yeah, I mean, 
And, and like, look what happened. Like we killed tens of thousands of people. And then, I mean, in the end in Iraq, you know, we ended up finding out almost all the people that hijacked the planes were from Saudi Arabia and get this, we are still selling weapons to Saudi Arabia after we blew up, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq. And when I was there too, um, I, um, I remember we were driving by the military base and my friend, um, it was also my translator uh, into Arabic. And he said, do you know what we call the U S military base? And I said, no. And he said, Al Qaeda. And I, I, I thought that's a bad joke. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm, he said, I'm not. He said, the word Al Qaeda means the base. And he said, the irony is that what Iraqi just, normal language would be for the U.S. military is the same language that you use for extremists. And he was saying, in the end, the people of Iraq have suffered from violence in all different fashions. But when someone's killing your kid, it just feels like terrorism. You don't care who did it. Right. And I think that's the same thing in Gaza right now. Right. Is like what is happening right now is collective punishment at a scale that no one can defend. You, you, there, there just comes a point where you go, how many children have to die in Gaza to atone for the sins on October 7th? And that's why it's even so helpful for our language. You know, you and I do so much preaching and teaching on the eye for an eye, which we've distorted and used in all kinds of um, offensive ways, but in, it was originally meant to stop the spiral of violence so that you could not overcompensate disproportionately for the harm done. You could break someone's arm if they broke your arm, but literally it would have limited the violence after September 11th to like 3000 people. It would have, that logic, right, would have limited the retaliation from October 7th to say you can't kill any more than 1,200 people. And yet 30,000 in now, we are only seeing like how terribly violence does beget violence. And and I think, you know, that's also where Jesus is a beautiful rebuke of that, right? Going, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye. Moses told you this, but I tell you this, he's going to even challenge us to, to imagine that we don't have to return harm for harm at all. Uh, so I think, mm-hmm. you know, even... The, just the, the 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 ways that we are watching this in real time and trying to defend something so indefensible is part of why I think you know so much of the world is rising up, and I want them to see Christians and Jewish folks and Muslims like all standing together against the spiral of violence, and so uh, I think it's an amazing time to be alive. And as you sort of say there, Shane, like yeah. Two, two wrongs didn't make a right, and 40,000 wrongs certainly hasn't made anything right. I, I kind of use it, bring back to Jesus, and I like to do this a lot, obviously, but this part of um, if violence was a way to get things done, Jesus would have done it, and he would have been better at it than us. You know, he's like, yo, I've got legions of angels I can call down fire. I don't. I, I love, one of my favorite pieces of scripture is when they say, Lord, should we call down fire? And it just said, Jesus turned and rebuked them. And I'm like, I think that's a very gentle edit from Luke because I think Jesus may have been a kind of strong rebuke. Like, have you missed yeah. the entire point of everything I'm doing here? Hey guys, thanks for listening. And thanks for being open to discover um, and be curious and to learn from voices that maybe you don't normally hear and topics that you really didn't sign up for in the season. But I think this crazy wild ride of discovery is a way of learning and growing and becoming even better humans together, whether we agree or not. So thanks for being on the ride. As a thank you, I wanted to offer you a code that you can enter at the Deep and Wide Academy. So that's at deepwideacademy.com, deepwideacademy.com. The code is right side up. That's the name of this podcast. (laughs) So just right side up at the deepwideacademy.com and it will get you 20% off on all of or any of the courses offered there. Those courses are intended to be deep and wide experiential wisdom shared uh, in order to pass it on, not just knowledge, but wisdom, which is applied knowledge and practice knowledge and embodied knowledge. So if this is something that might interest you, which I hope it is, and you either want to check it out and learn or you want to be a collaborator and you can contact us uh, in that regard. But anyway, check it out. Code right side up. It'll get you 20% off and deepwideacademy.com is available 
for you. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of this episode. <laughs> Absolutely. Shane, Shane, how do you stay hopeful? Uh, mm, you yeah, stay, I was wondering that. <laughs> you know, in that I'm going to prophetically imagine till the end of my days, like no one could, like, how do you stay in a place where you don't get hard hearted? Do you have any tips for other peacemakers out there? Ironically, in the places that I've felt would be most hopeless, they're filled with hope. Um, and sometimes um, it's it's a defiant hope. It's a Jesus anchored hope. I mean, that's what I felt when I was in the West Bank. Um, there's deep grief, but there is, I mean, hope was thick in the air. It was in everything that we heard. It was uh, in the songs that we sang, this hope that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. So it was this really robust, beautiful hope. Um, and it's also in what Jesus endured for us, right? Like when, when Munther talks about Jesus, you know, in the rubble, that we have a God that is with the suffering and with those who are hurting. And, and literally scripture says, if one part of the body suffers, we all suffer with it. So I think we're, that call is to lean in wherever there is suffering. And October 7th, that meant that we were standing against the violence of Hamas. And since October 7th, that means we're grieving with Gaza and we're standing against the violence there. So, um, but I do a lot of things. I mean, one of them you mentioned, you know, we, we uh, have this wonderful practice of uh, turning guns into garden tools. And so this is one of our uh, shovels that even the handle is made from the wood stock of the gun and uh, my wife and I are both aspiring blacksmiths now. And so, but, but part of that practice of like beating the metal of a gun, um, it's become a way of praying and a way of channeling our anger and pain. And, and so when we started doing it, we were taken by the symbolism, the poetic, you know, the kind of prophetic imagination of it. And there's that piece of it for sure. But there's also a part of it that is real. Um, uh, a way of turning pain into concrete change. And I mean, I, I think of my friend Sharon Risher, whose family was killed by Dylan Roof in Emmanuel AME Church in the middle of their Wednesday night, you know, Bible study. And as she was beating on the barrel of the gun, she just collapsed, you know, and she named all nine of her family members, her mo mother, Ethel Lance. And, and then um, uh, she, she told me, she said, everything I've thought of doing to Dylan Roof, I just took it out on the barrel of that gun. <laughs> so, so there's something about that. I think that we need new ways of praying, right? And there are new ways of creating liturgy. And um, I mean, when we talk about turning guns into garden tools, we say it's sacramental and we don't use that word lightly. You know, we, 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 um, the word sacrament means holy mystery. And so we all often think of things like communion, you know, and like the mystery of communion. This is the body and blood of Jesus. But there's also like, I think, a sacramental part of this that is saying every time we do it, we're declaring that all things can be made new. And I often tell my evangelical friends, this is what a gun looks like when it gets born again. And, and what's true of metal is also true of human hearts. They can be transformed. Someone who's killed. So another person is more than the worst thing that they've ever done. And that's a miracle of the, the Holy Spirit to be able to to transform hearts um, and policies can also be transformed. So that's why we have to kind of defiantly say um, it doesn't have to be this way. And just as we can reimagine metal, we can reimagine social policies and heart change and policy change don't have to be. Um, seen as separate, right? When people say to me, it's a not a gun problem, it's a heart problem, or, or sometimes they say it's a sin problem. Uh, I like to say it can be both. You know, God heals hearts and people change laws. And people like Dr. Martin Luther King are really helpful in that because they knew it was both. You know, and Dr. King said, a law cannot make a man love me, but it can make it harder for him to kill me. <laughs> And so that's what we need to be doing, right, is trying to make it harder for people to kill. At the same time, knowing that you can't legislate love, you can't all outlaw racism. Um, okay. But we, we really need to pray that God would change hearts and God may be looking at us, you know, looking to us to change some of our policies. And that's why I think, you know, when it comes to supporting 
Israel in the current uh, violence in Gaza, like we can pray and we should pray, but we should also get up off our knees and say, um, what might God give me the, the, the tools to, to, to bring change with right now? And as one of my, my mentors said, uh, when you ask God to move a mountain, God might give you a shovel. <laughs> so okay. yeah, let's, let's be ready to, to, to participate in the change that we want to see in the world. You know, I was with a, a Syrian brother of mine here in my home group, and he was telling me that in, in Syria and that part of the world, that when you feel overwhelmed or like, like oppressed, you say, I feel like I've got a mountain on my chest. Mm. Wow. And so he said, when he first read the words of Jesus that said to the disciples, if you have faith, you could say to this mountain, move, and it would mm. move. He said, I always just, I assume Jesus meant this thing that feels like I'm going to die. Yeah. Yeah. This crushing weight can be lifted if we have faith, you know? And he goes, it wasn't until I came to Canada that you guys are like thinking it's physical mountains. He's like, do you like, why would we want to move a mountain? Like, it's like, he's like, what's wrong with you What would be the guys? point of that? Like, yeah. <laughs> he's just like, I don't get you guys. And I was like, that was the first time I'd ever heard that. But I thought, wow, what a beautiful, like, um, particularly so when you're feeling crushed, you know, when you're feeling that weight. And I feel like I just have like a little tiny taste, just what, like, cause I feel like to spectate injustice is even weightier than to even be in it. Cause at least in it, you're in it. You know what I mean? Like you, it's real, like you're fighting it. But like when you're spectating, I just feel like it's like the, like you just had a baby recently or your wife did. And it's like watching a woman in labor, I think is harder than the woman in labor mm. because you're so, you feel like so helpless and just like, I don't know what to do. Like you're just like, and your wife's like, they're like dying. And, um, this kind of sense of like helplessness and, um, and I wonder that, I wonder how to move that for, so that's part of my, like, you know, we can't all fly to, to Bethlehem. We can't all, but what can we do? What is the thing that is a faith filled action that would get this mountain off of our chest? Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, I think just speaking up, I think just speaking up, I think paying attention, I think um, the perspective we're listening to matters. You know, who is on the ground? Who are the voices that we listen to? It's one of the things I've loved about your strategy of even just, you know, uh, uh, getting the live stream straight from Bethlehem. Like, why don't you just talk to, listen to Month or give his message and, and listen to him? He lives there. He knows what's happening. He's a Christian mm -hmm. leader, you know. What are some other yeah. techniques or strategies for people right now? What do we do when we're bombarded by this mountain? And yeah, that's great. I think we, we've got to get into yeah. that. Yeah, because, uh, uh, you know, th there's that old saying that the hardest part about running a marathon is not getting to the finish line, but getting to the starting line. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's true that sometimes it's just like the first steps towards that. Like we, we kind of get paralyzed in our um, cynicism, our you know, exhaustion, the daily tweets that we see and the news that we see, like, what can you actually do? I think that's where you just got to move a little bit, you know, and, and maybe it's um, getting into new spaces, go, you know, going to a Palestinian owned restaurant and talking to them, because I know every time I interact with um, Palestinian Americans right now, they just want to know that they're not alone and that people are seeing what's happening in their hearts are heavy, you know, and it means the world, just small symbols of, um, of, of new friendship and of like, um, uh, I mean, there's, there's bigger ways too. I mean, a friend of mine had this incredible kind of Holy spirit orchestrated thing that happened. They've got a young woman from Gaza that's living with them now. And they've got three young girls, you know, girls of their own young women now that are that, but they've got this young woman from Gaza that's living with them and it, everything's different, you know, like they're able to support her, but she's also opening their eyes up to the new realities because her family's still over there. Um, she was kind of an exchange student here. So there's like, there's whole networks, world relief and others now that are creating ways that congregations can support immigrants and refugees. So I think all that gives us some handholds to feel like even if we're not welcoming a family from Gaza, like you're welcoming a family from Venezuela or whatever. Like, I think it's just a way that we can exercise love and compassion and um, stand against fear, you know, and, and um, a lot of this is 
is, is how we're being conditioned to fear other people. And uh, so just to say, I'm going to stand on the promise that perfect love casteth out fear. Hallelujah. You know, that's where we're going to go. Um, and uh, uh, so the, the other the other thought I had on it, Daniel, was that um, the, the micro and the macro, I think, have to go together. Uh, so sometimes I know folks that are giving out food all the time in North Philadelphia. And we get tired if we aren't doing something about why people are hungry to begin with. Um, mm. But on the other hand, I've got friends in DC that are working on policy changes and they get exhausted and they get cynical. They get tired if they aren't in the neighborhood, you know, having a, a playing in a water f- fountain, or, you know, like a, our fire hydrants that we open up or helping a kid with homework. So I think that those are like things that have to go together is, that we can't just be in the streets protesting and working on policy change without having relationships with people who have been really impacted. Um, But then if we get just so hyper local that we aren't addressing some of the crushing policies on others, then I think you can get tired of just hearing story after story, like with gun violence, like Mm -hmm. one grieving mother, one grieving friend, you know, after another, and everybody offering thoughts and prayers while refusing to make changes that would save lives. I think that gets also tiring if we're just doing the pastoral comforting work that is holy work, but that has to be coupled with the prophetic, you know, social change that we need as well. So I I think holding those together becomes really important. And that's what I love about being near to the folks that are impacted. Like when, when we are able to go over and be with, you know, Palestinian Christians, like it, it, it being near to the suffering, mm-hmm. um, it um, brings our own faith to life. And I think it also, there's things that we don't think about, right? I mean, even just now we were, I was just hearing, we're sending a whole bunch of aid into Gaza that, that many people that listen to Red Letter Christians have helped fundraise. You know, we raised $150,000, but there are people who have bottled salt water and you can buy a whole skit of this and not know that you're buying salt water because it's packaged and, you know, it's brought in like it's brand new bottles of water. So then you get that aid in that you paid for. So there's people, there's like stuff that you don't even, I mean, it's evil, but it's also like, mm-hmm. unless we know the people on the ground, mm-hmm. we don't know the obstacles. Now, the other obstacle is that some of the groups that are actually able to get good aid into Gaza are also kind of um, double covers. They're, aiding the Israeli military, right? I won't name names, but people, you know, (laughs) so they're giving, they're giving guns to Israel and giving food to Gaza. And so like, these are deep principalities and powers that are at work. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got to know that these are not human forces, but spiritual forces that we're up against. But we, until we're really in touch with the human beings, um, that are on the ground in these places, we don't even know what we're doing. You know, you can give money to an organization that's uh, that's doing more harm than good. And so I think that's why being centered around the people impacted is is where we've got to do it. And that's why, you know, your work, our work at Red Letter Christians, we're going to continue to um, uh, have at the very heart of it, the theologians, pastors, relief workers, people whose family are in Gaza right now that are helping um, guide us in, in the best way forward. And they're also people that love um, uh, Jewish folks and that love the people of Israel. I know that like when your government is doing this, um, it's hurting the people in Gaza, but it's also hurting the entire world. And it's hurting yeah. like no one... Um, no one is better off when we see the kind of mm-hmm. violence and people trying to justify and defend that violence. Yeah, it just it, it destroys, kills and steals everybody from everybody, yeah. even the perpetrators. And this is why Jesus wants it to stop. huh? Yeah. Shane, would you just uh, would you just pray for us and everyone who's listening to this? And then I think we'll we'll call it an episode. But I'd love for you to just. <laughs> Just pray a blessing and for insight, whatever you feel prompted to. But I'd love, I'd love for you to pray for us. I would love that too. And I hope I get to hang out with y'all in person soon, but this has been wonderful and let's, let's keep the conversation going. So yeah. Mm. Sweet Lord. 
Prince of Peace, Jesus, uh, we pray that you would guide us, that you would give us imagination, that we might not conform to the patterns of this world, but that we might be transformed, that we might have a renewing of our mind, a new imagination, um, and how we live in the world in light of your love, in light of your cross. We, we grieve over the violence, just as you wept over Jerusalem because it didn't know what would lead for peace. We, we, we weep with you now over uh, the lives lost in Gaza and over the families that are looking for their, their loved ones being held hostage to be brought home. We, we pray that you would show us another way than returning evil for evil. Help us to overcome evil with good, as your scripture says. Pray that you would give us courage. Uh, for all of our friends, uh, bishops and archbishops and pastors and um, pastors in Gaza right now with the, that growing, the, that little remnant of ancient Palestinian Christians in Gaza and the West Bank for courage to speak truth and to speak love and compassion into a very volatile, hostile situation right now. And for us, we, we pray that you would give us courage, that you would help us to ask, what does love require of us right now? We do pray that you would open concrete ways that we could show that love and solidarity locally, that you would give us new eyes to see people we might have missed, um, to build friendships and solidarity with uh, Palestinians right now and um folks that are different from us that might eat different or look different or speak differently. Um, may we be peacemakers and bridge builders and holy trespassers of cultural boundaries that have been raised. And so give us courage, give us love. Thanks for friends, for friends like Danielle and James that can continue to, uh, stir us to remind us that we're not alone and to uh, encourage us as we encourage one another to continue to follow you and even when people say that it is naive or unrealistic that we would read your sermon on the mount and say what if you really meant the stuff you said may it change our lives and I pray if there's anyone that's listening in today that um, might be hearing of your love and your justice in a new way that they would keep that they would keep leaning in to you, Jesus, uh, even in spite of maybe some of the things that they've heard or felt from Christianity or the church. And pray that we would all be better off as we are transformed by your love and your grace. In Christ's name. Amen. Really well, that's a long prayer, exactly. but there you go. God you asked me. No, <laughs> I could pray for another hour and I'd be here. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Thanks for not just uh, praying with words, but with your life. And you with too. Your choices you too. really matters. I'm encouraged by you. Love you deeply. Be blessed. You too. Okay. Thank you.